Hello, and welcome to another edition of Claus and Sagas. My name is Lee Smith, head instructor, Blood and Iron Martial Arts, and of course we have our historian, Michael Clausen. Go figure. <laughs> All right. So today's today's uh, topic is going to be Hema and academia. Oh, this is going to be an interesting one, and probably a hot topic for some people. Interesting for you, especially because you're kind of between both worlds. I definitely am. I am one of few, if any, that am currently getting my graduate education in um, medieval studies while also practicing Hema. So let's talk about like like your specialty, medieval studies, and how do you think that can really benefit Hema practitioners, like historical fencers like myself. I think the expertise of academia in the cultural context and knowing the events and connecting various factors of events, so on and so forth, can really benefit HEMA practitioners because if you have that kind of background knowledge, you can understand the manuscripts that you're looking at and understand why they're written in such a way, made in such a way, and it can aid in your interpretation of the motions and the movements and the techniques in a treatise and translate it more clearly and more accurately to your actual practice. So like the area of academia that you represent, medieval studies for example, like how do you see that really benefiting a practitioner myself in, in terms of like which manuscripts? Because I mean, if you look at something like uh, like the later period, like, like Meyer for example, he's pretty, it's, it's pretty like cut and dry. He gives you, if you understand physiology and then you understand the techniques he's trying to, to convey, it becomes pretty obvious what he wants. I mean, a little bit of help might clarify a few things, like a few, few details, but for the most part, it can be done with like modern medical science and understanding physiology, plus the manuscript itself. What manuscripts do you think, like, would, we think, we're talking early period ones, would definitely help with the experimental archaeology facets? I would say experimental archaeology would definitely help with those that are maybe missing information or are brief and vague. Maybe whoever had it made presumed a level of knowledge of whoever would be reading it. And a medieval studies scholar can really help kind of fill in those historical gaps. Why was it made this way? Who made it? What were kind of the literary traditions at the time of it being made? Something that a HEMA practitioner may not know or think about or have access to the resources to actually read about it. Because sometimes there is a bit of a library wall or a database wall where you have to sign in or pay for it to actually get that information. Interesting. Can you just give me an example? Um, something like um, the University of Victoria Library. You have to be a student to access the digital uh, corpus of material. You could go in there, you could buy um, you know, a library card, a library membership, but not everyone wants to spend that money. Not everybody lives close enough to a library like that to really make it practical. And it may not always be in that person's native language or even a language they speak. Okay, so then we start going globally. Not everything is centered in one collection. Mm -hmm. There's multiple collections, meaning that you'd have to have a pass to multiple sources or have academic credentials to get access to some sources. Yes, you can't just read one source and use that as your entire basis. That's not what scholars even do. That's not what I do when I'm researching, and I don't think that's what a HEMA practitioner should do either. Okay, so so basically, so there's a lot of gaps in the presumed knowledge, you'd yes. say. Okay, so if we're looking at something like, for example, like I-33, like that manuscript, which I mean, I mean, it definitely doesn't feel complete. Mm -hmm. So how would like how would you go about like creating supplemental supplementary resources for something like I-33? So it'd be easier and like more complete under to understand for the average HEMA practitioner. I think a good start would be understanding how manuscripts were made and why were they made in such a way. And having a general background knowledge on that literary culture, I think would probably be the primary start. And a scholar, whether you want to collaborate with them on actually publishing something or just asking them for information or resources you can access would be the perfect start. So something like art related, for example. Yes, so a medieval art historian. There's many of those scholars. You can always see if they have any information or background or even themselves wrote an article on what you're looking at. Could there be like adjunctive treatises written at the same time? Things like um, on like physical health, sports, medicine, other stuff like that that possible, to possibly exist? There were many medical treatises. I don't know exactly if those will help you with 
understanding these because those did pertain more closely to disease and medicine more so than biomechanics. Not to mention, it, it was not like they were snapping photographs of, <laughs> of people. <laughs> Yeah, so it's still up to artist interpretation. It really is. As you look at the two worlds, where do you see the, the real disconnect from academia and historical fencing, for example? Scholars in medieval history, if they're studying combat, they're not actively engaging with HEMA itself. They're not martial artists. They don't have a martial arts background with blade work. So they have that disconnect of what's practical and what actually makes sense in a real combat scenario. If you're a HEMA practitioner... You don't have the education and the resources that a scholar does have, so there's a disconnect there as well. And what I would like is for that disconnect to be bridged. So HEMA practitioners, scholars, they communicate together and create great pieces of work and let us know more about what we're looking at. There are some great scholars out there, guys like Je Dr. Jeffrey Forgang, for example, Quite, probably, in my opinion, probably has the best translations in any of any HEMA manuscript out there to date. Not very controversial, I'll say, for some people, but, I mean, in my opinion, it's true. So you have a guy like that, translate Meyer, translate I-33. Guy's brilliant. So, but we also have people who kind of, like, made translations that, well, aren't so good. So mm -hmm. I think you're saying is people like that who made things that aren't so good. They don't really have a background in academia. They're really missing things to make that translation complete. Mm -hmm. I think we need a lot more communication, and there's simply not enough right now. So, for example, when we're looking at a manuscript, and we're and we're trying to piece it together, right? We have some we have some translations that are good, and some are not so good. When the translation is not so good, do you think we're missing a lot of information, in your opinion? And if and 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 if so, why are we missing the information? What what parts are, what parts of the average person missing? I think the average person would be missing overarching the cultural context. Now that cultural context can be a number of things. It could be art, it could be literature, it could even be dialects of language spoken that we just simply don't have. And if we engage more deeply with academia, then we may be able to fill in more and more of those gaps. And maybe if we fill in one gap, it'll then lead to filling another gap, which then leads to filling another gap. And fill as much information as we can, get the fullest picture we can. So I was taking research courses like a few years ago. One of the big things that came up in both in like qualitative and quantitative studies is a, th is a phenomenon called cherry picking. How do we fix that in terms of like essentially manuscript creation? We will have definitely have people cherry picking, and I'm sure they do already. But how do we fix that to make sure that the source, the sources we have are as, I mean, accurate and pure as possible? I think um, academia making more information available to the HEMIC community because then you can cross-reference different articles and different pieces of information together and it leads to a lot less cherry-picking if you have more information to look at. Because if one article is definitive on one subject, that might be one out of the 50 articles that's that definitive. So it makes it more difficult to cherry-pick. Gotcha. And if you have more reliable authors, more reliable sources known for accuracy, you're going to have a better product long term. Exactly. So anything else you want to add to finish up here? Always look at the cultural context. I cannot stress that enough. I've talked to some HEMA practitioners that simply didn't understand the historical context, had never read about it, or they maybe read one article. It's simply not enough from a research standpoint. Okay, so if we look at what you mean by cultural context, what does it mean like nomenclature of guards, for example? That as well. It could be... Say you're looking at 15th century Germany, a treatise from there. Research 15th century Germany. And if you can narrow down the um, city or the region that the manuscript was made in, research that specifically too. Really understand what you're, not just what you're looking at, but when you're looking at and who you're looking at. So you think looking at other literature written in the same time period, for example, or other papers written in the same time period, including like, or looking even at like art. In the same time period would be helpful. Definitely. Looking at art from the same time period, same region, same city if you can, perfect. To kind of finish up here, what you're saying then when we look at like academia versus I mean, amateur historians like most human practitioners are, you'd look at academia having a, a large number of resources that simply are not, are not available to the layman. Yes, and I think we need to make that more available or more easily available. Maybe uh, have a website that's 
a corpus of information specifically for HEMA from scholars and libraries and images of facsimiles so HEMA practitioners can engage with that material. I mean, people have tried, but I mean, I would, I would argue that most of those resources right now are still like infant stages and really not that good. So what you're saying is something of a higher grade so we can actually push this forward. Yes, really have something of a professional grade, someone that has access to all the resources and can create a page, a website that everyone else can also engage with. Really a committed database. Well, thank you for today's interview. It was very informative as always. Mm -hmm. I hope you guys enjoyed this installment of Klaus and Sagas. Keep your axes sharp and your mind sharper.